So t tonight's sermon uh, is really just an exhortation and a reminder uh, for us to keep God first, to keep God first in our lives. So that's the title of my sermon, is Keeping God First. So what we're going to do is we're just going to look at four different scripture passages uh, just to remind us that God should always be first and foremost in our life. He should always take the highest priority. He should always get the first serving, if that makes sense. And, and, and we always got to keep him in mind whenever we do anything. So we're going to look at four passages of scripture, and then we're going to look at a few different practical examples that I've just thought of that, that applied to my life as well. And I'm sure it applies to yours, and, and that's going to be the sermon today. So keeping God first. Now, when I think of keeping God first, the passage that first comes to mind is, is Matthew 6. Matthew 6. So we'll go there first in Matthew 6. It says here in Matthew 6, verse 31, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? So I've just underlined eat, drink, and clothed, because this is the context of this passage. Because oftentimes this passage is abused by the prosperity type preachers. They try and preach that if you keep God first, you're going to be healthy, wealthy, and wise, as opposed to just being promised that you'll have food and clothing. It says, for after all these things, so what are the these, all these things that it's referring to? It's referring to having enough to eat, having enough to drink, and being clothed, right? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. So it's just not just all these things, it's not everything you want, right? It's not seek first the kingdom of God and then you're going to get that boat, or that bigger house or that, that job promotion, which is often how people say, hey, just seek God first and then all these things will be added unto you. No, it's you seek first and God will make sure that your necessities are taken care of. You don't have to worry about those things. It says here, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. So verse 33 is really the one I want you guys to dwell on and think about that we ought to seek first the kingdom of god because honestly that's why we go work that's why we work a job and we do all these things because we're trying to fulfill first and foremost our bare necessities and god is saying hey even before you worry about your bare necessities your food your clothing you ought to be seeking the things of god first first seek the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you take therefore no thought for the morrow so this verse is not saying that you don't plan, you don't, you don't think about your retirement, you don't think about the future. I mean, we read through Proverbs, it talks about leaving an inheritance for your children and wise men, you know, don't just spend all their money and they're diligent and things like that. So this is not saying take no thought for the morrow, meaning don't even think about what happens in the future. Now what this is saying is don't worry about the future, right? You don't worry about these things. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. And I love this last phrase here. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. What is this saying? There's enough things to worry about today than to have to worry about things in the future. Right? There's enough evil coming in the day. There's enough things to, to do in the day than to worry about what's happening in the future. You know, you just seek first the kingdom of God and these things shall be added unto you. So keeping God first. Another passage we'll look at as well is the obvious one, uh, which is the great commandment. Matthew 22, verse 35. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. So really you're loving God. In another passage it says, with all thy heart, mind, soul and strength. So really it's everything you have, everything you are. If you think about your heart, you're, you're loving God with the passion, with the heart, with the desire, with all your soul. What is that? It's like, it's like who you are. You know, who you are should be about God, right? How you identify. Do people know you as a Christian? Do you live as a Christian? You know, are you known? To be a christian and with all your mind do you think about god all the time do you think about his word do you think how you can serve him better how you can be a better testimony these are the sort of things you think of is god on your mind or is god an afterthought right this is how we keep god first we love god with all our heart with all our soul 
and with all our mind. Look at this. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. So you see, we keep God first. We love others second. And even here, there's nothing about ourselves, right? There's no third great commandment, which is now you serve yourself. There's just the first and second, which is to love your, your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets, right? So when we keep all of God's commandments, we'll feel, fulfill the first and the second commandment. But the first is to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. 1 Corinthians 10, this is another one we'll look at, and we'll be reminded that in this passage, this is a famous passage, you know, whatsoever do you do, do all to the glory of God. But we'll just look at a, a bit of the context so we, don't, uh, so we understand what it's talking about. In 1 Corinthians 10, it says here in verse 23, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. Now, some people take this passage out of context and they say, well, the Bible says all things are lawful for me. So that means I'm allowed to do anything. You know, I'm, a, I'm under grace, right? There's no sin anymore. No, that's not what this passage is teaching. Remember, we have to think about what the context is in 1 Corinthians 10, right? And this is talking about eating specific foods offered to idols. So all things are lawful for me. So there are things that are of doubtful disputation. Right, the Bible talks about. And all these things, things that are of doubtful disputation, there's nothing wrong about them inherently. And that's what he's saying. These things, all these things, because the context of this is a doubtful disputation, which is eating things sacrificed to idol. He says, all these, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. Right? So they're not always proper to do, even though they're not necessarily sinful. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. So even though things are necess aren't necessarily sinful, that doesn't mean they're proper or they're wise or they're the best thing to do by other people. And this is what this passage is talking about. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. So this lines up with, you know, to love your neighbor as yourself, right? And we keep, if we love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, we're going to love our neighbor as ourselves. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Whatsoever is sold in the shambles. So what is the shambles in the Bible? It's like a marketplace. So if you think about, like when you go to, we don't so much have them here. I mean, here it's more of a novelty when you go to the city and they have the street markets and it's like, you know, it's kind of, it's a festival. And, you know, those, those, those store owners, they must, they pay so much money to have a stall in those markets. But, you know, when you're like in places like Mexico and probably places like in the, in the, in the New Testament time, uh, in the early church times, you know, a lot of the food markets are just on the street, right? Just street markets all the time every weekend. And, and a lot of commerce goes through those sort of areas. So he says, whatsoever is sold in the shambles, that eat. So you see how the context here is about eating what, what you eat, asking no question for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So he's saying, well, because everything belongs to the Lord in the earth, you can eat. Everything is okay to eat. Um, says, if any of them that believe not bid you to a feast and ye be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you, eat, asking no question for conscience sake. So it's saying if you go and eat with an unbeliever and they feed you, you just eat. You don't ask anything about the food because, um, you know, the earth, it says here, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Just like when you go to the markets and you eat every, anything, you don't have to ask what's happened to it or what's been done to it asking no question for conscience sake. But if any man say unto you, this is offered in sacrifice unto idols, look at this, eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So it's interesting that he uses that same phrase, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, saying, hey, well, you can eat everything because it belongs to the Lord. And then he says, there are certain things you ought not eat because everything ought to be done for the Lord, right? Whereas when something is sacrificed unto idols, you shouldn't eat those things. Now he says here, for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Conscience, I say, look at this, because when you read these passages before, you think, well, you don't want to think that you're doing wrong. But actually what this passage is saying, he says, conscience, I say, not thine own. So it's not about you, it being wrong for you. Because when we know that an idol's nothing, right? Which is what he's talking about here. So he's saying we, we can eat anything. Because even if somebody sacrifices the idol, it didn't change the food. The food's still the same. The idol's a false god. 
conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? So he's saying if somebody else thinks it's wrong, why, why does that make it wrong for me? This is the topic of doubtful disputations, where there is no clear-cut right or wrong whether you should eat this food or not. But he's saying, why shouldn't we eat that food if an unbeliever says, hey, this has been sacrificed to idols? For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that which I give thanks? So why is it, why is it wrong, basically, when he's saying don't eat? Because you don't want to condone what that person is doing so you don't if their conscience is thinking hey is this right for me to sacrifice this food and then you go yeah i'm going to eat with you you are condoning that activity and that's why he's saying hey don't eat it not because it's wrong for you or it's inherently sinful because you should be considering other people when you go about your day and that's what the context is of first corinthians 10 thinking about your actions and how they affect other people. Not that it dictates what you do, but it ought to be a consideration. And here's one example where Paul would say, hey, you don't eat, right, through the Holy Spirit. You don't eat if you know that this food has been sacrificed to a false god. Now, getting back to the topic of the sermon in verse 31, so this is the context, and he says, whether therefore ye eat or drink, but he also says, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. So even something as mundane as eating and drinking, God says you need to keep in mind God because you're going to eat and drink something sacrificed to idols. God comes first and you say no to that. So whatsoever ye do, so it's not just the eating and drinking because he includes all whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. We have to remember to keep God first, even in how we conduct ourselves in hospitality, right? what we eat. And what we drink. Colossians 1. This is the last one we'll look at and then we'll go through a couple of uh, practical examples. Colossians 1 in verse 16. This is one of the, the more famous passages where we are exhorted to always be reminded to keep Jesus first. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers all things were created by him and for him so jesus not only created all things but he created them for him that includes you right that includes you we were created not only by god but for him and that ought to remind us why do i even survive what i mean why do i even live why do i even breathe why do i why does god even give me the strength and the energy to do what i'm doing it's for him Right? And oftentimes we forget that because we think it's for us. We think we've got to go to work to serve man, to serve us, to work for that next holiday, to work for that next material good, work for that next pleasure that we're striving for. And we need to remember, no, 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 you are here to serve God first and foremost. We've got to keep God first. Look at this. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church. So not only in our personal life, in our working life, even in our spiritual life, in this spiritual body here, Jesus Christ is first. The church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. See, this all things in this context is literally all things, right? Because Jesus, in verse 16, created all things, and in all things he has the priority, the preeminence, the superiority. I mean, you can look up the definition of preeminence and there's all these words. Just, it just basically means first. Right? He comes first. So that's what I want to remind you guys of today. And we'll just go through a couple of practical examples as we talk about keeping God first. And the first thing I want to remind you of today is just keeping God first in your schedule. Keeping God first in your schedule. Does God have priority in your schedule? Now, I was always uh, told this quote. I don't know who, who wrote this quote, but... Uh, somebody told me once, that which gets scheduled gets done. You know, I don't know if that's true. You know, maybe you schedule things, you don't get them done. You know, <laughs> just think, you know, people write a to-do list and they just don't get it done. So maybe that's not always true. But they say that, and, and the principle here is, and I've heard a lot of even like self-help motivational speakers, like finance speakers talk about this as well. Like, you know, not, not just motivating yourself to do things, but scheduling it into your life, integrating it into your life so that you can't help but do it. Right? And oftentimes when you do things with other people, 
there's some accountability there. It forces you to, like people that find it hard to exercise, for example. They find it hard to exercise, so they'll join a group or they'll join a gym. So they've, they've committed to it, right? Maybe they they've need to fork out their money to, to put it into their schedule so that it's prioritized. It should be like that with God, right? That's why it should be like that with God as well. So let's look at our different areas of our spiritual life. With church, I mean, let's talk about church first and foremost, right? Is church a priority in your life? Does it take priority over other events? Because so many events can happen on a Sunday, right? So many events can happen on, you know, if our church met Sunday morning, events can happen on Sunday morning, events can happen Sunday night. So when God, do you keep God first in your schedule in the sense that church takes a priority? And, you know, a lot of family stuff happens on weekends, you know, and especially if, you ha if you're a Christian and you have a family, don't have things on Sundays, you know, don't have things when people ought to be at church because church is a time where everyone should be gathered together. So church is like less flexible of a time. Right? Because it's a time where it's just set and everyone needs to be there at that time. Soul winning is a bit more flexible, right? Because you can go throughout the week, you can, you can make it at other times and things like that. But the danger there is, is when you don't set a time for soul winning and you just say, well, I'm just going to go whenever. Chances are you won't go. You know, if we're honest with ourselves. A very few of us have the, the, uh, are that sort of type of spiritual juggernaut that you'll just go soul winning even without, you know, on your own, without a partner at, at, a, at another time. That's why we have times where we get together and we have an official soul winning time. It's not just go soul winning in your own time. We try and set some times where people are there so that, you know, you feel like you're going along and being part of something. So it's good for a church to have official organized times so at the very least those of us who are not at that spiritual level where we're disciplined enough to go have something to just tag along to right rather than having to to pick their themselves up because we've all been there right it's, it's difficult because soul winning is a lot harder than going to church because when you go to church you're just sitting there you're being fed right you don't have to actually do any work Whereas soul winning, you're actually doing the work now. You have to get out there. You have to put yourself in a, in a more uncomfortable situation. So it, it, it is more likely for people to let that slip. So church, does church take a priority in your life? You know, when you have family events, I mean, just take a stand. You know, if not now, when? You know, when your family has events on the weekend, if you keep going along to those events, then they're going to keep having them on the weekend. You know, like my family had events on Sunday as well until they realized, hey, I'm never there when, when they have it on a Sunday. And they, if they want the whole family to be there, then it has to be on a Saturday. You know, so take that stand. You know, I mean, you think about what Jesus did for you and it's like you can't even take a stand in your family. You know, you take a stand against your family, especially if you're the man of the house. You know, take a stand for your family. Say, no, my family's going to church and then we'll have to come later, you know, if we're, if we're going to make it to you later, if, you know, if, if it goes till that late. Um, so not only take a stand in your family, but, you know, be the example to your family too. You know, if you, if you take that stand, then that's showing your family as well that God comes first. So keep God first. Remember, God comes above family as well. And when you keep God first, you're also loving your family because you're setting the right example because you're making them understand and making them see from your testimony that God is important, right? That he, that he should be first in your life. And, you know, unbelievers, they can do things on Saturdays. You know what I mean? They got their, they got their Saturday on, and Sunday, so if they really want a believer to be there, I just think, you know, I'm going to go. I can do things on Saturdays, whereas Sundays, if I've got church, I'm going to give them to the Lord. So how do you keep God first in church? I mean, when you think about church, you know, is it something just to get done on Sunday? Do you have that mentality that when you come to church, I'm just ticking off a spiritual box and just thinking, I just got to get, I just got to do the church thing. Or do you come to, to actually, you know, serve God, you know, meet God's people, be part of, be present here. You know, some people, they go to church, but they're not really present. Right? They're just going there because they have to and then they're, they're somewhere else. They're thinking of something else they have to do. So when you come to church, is it just something to get done or is it what you're doing on Sunday? Uh, and, and just another thing, last thing about church as well, is just work. You know, when people have to work on Sunday and they can't get to church, you know, what, what do you do then? My, my, my opinion is you should get a different job. You know, if you have to work on Sunday, try and move into a different line of work so that you can go to church because God always should take preeminence. Now, I remember when I was, uh, when I was studying 
And uh, you know, when you're studying, really you only work in hospitality or retail, right? You either work in retail, you work on Thursday nights and Saturdays, or you work in hospitality so that you can work on the weekends and at night time. Now, when you're studying and you're, you're trying to you know, uh, go to church, uh, but you know, when I was, in, when I was uh, uh, younger, we had the Friday night youth group, and then we had obviously church on Sunday. And on Sunday, we had Sunday morning, and then we had like an old folks home ministry in the afternoon, and then we'd have nighttime free. So sometimes I would work Sunday night. But I remember when I went for a job when I was younger, uh, I, I, went, I, I took this restaurant job. And I remember telling the, the boss, I said to him, you know, I can work any day, I can work any weekday, I just can't work Friday nights, and I can't work on Sundays. And, you know, what I'll say to you, if you, if you work hard, if you're a good worker, they'll, they'll, let you, they'll give you that job, you know, if, if you work hard. So I didn't have to work Fridays uh, for a long time, and I, didn't, and I didn't work Sundays. And then what happened at work is the managers swapped, right? There was a new manager. I took over that restaurant. And then he rostered me on a Friday, right? And I already said, to, I, I called him on the phone, I said, I already told the person that hired me, you know, I, I'd take this job, but I cannot work on Friday nights because I've got church on Friday nights and I can't work on Sunday. And you know what he did? He actually said to me on the phone, he goes, if you don't come in on Friday night, then don't come in again. And then he hung up on me. And I was just thinking, I wasn't sure whether he was just, you know, angry at the time, or he had actually fired me. So then on the Saturday, which was the next day I had my shift, I just came in to see him and I just said, I don't know if I still got a job, but I just thought I'd come in anyway, because I wasn't sure whether he was being serious. And then, and then after the shift, he sat me down and he apologized and he said he'd spoken to, he spoke to the manager that hired me and found out. So all this to say this, right? If, if you just let your boss know up front that you can't work these certain days and you're a good worker, you know, they'll keep you. They'll, they'll work around your schedule because it's actually pretty hard to find a good, reliable worker. Um, otherwise, just, just get another job. To me, it's like I was willing to lose that job because God was more important to me at the time, you know? So God was more important to me. I was willing to find another job if this job was forcing me to work Fridays and Sundays because I was trying to keep God first in my schedule. The same happened when I went to Phoenix. You know, when I went to Phoenix, I was looking for a job. I ended up working at Fry's Electronics, which was an electronics store there. And, there, and in, in the United States, you know, it's not like, you, you know, you work in the electronics store in retail and you're working nine to five because over in the States, they're, they're open until like 10, 11 o'clock at night, right? So, but I, I said to them as well, you know, I can work any time during the week, but at, at, the time, at, at Faithful Word, it was Wednesday night and it was soul winning before Wednesday night and then there was Sunday. I said, I can work any day except Wednesday night and Sundays. And you know what, they, what my roster was at Fry's? It was Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, early in the morning, stop at four, four o'clock. So I had to, I had to work extra, the extra early shift on Wednesday just so I could get off at four o'clock and then I could go soul winning and then I never worked on Sundays. But my boss was happy to give me those hours because when I worked, I worked hard, right? I was a good employee. I made a lot of sales. I worked in sales then. I was one of the top salesmen there. So he liked me. So he was happy for me to work around my schedule. Now, not every job is like that, you know, and I'm, I know there are exceptions out there, but the principle is still the same. You know, are you even making an effort? You know, some people take a job and, you know, they're so desperate for that job that they have to work Saturday and Sunday, they just take it. Well, just, well you, there are jobs out there where you don't have to work at times where you need to be at church. So is God first in your schedule? We already talked about church, you know, and soul winning. You know, have you made time for this? You know, soul winning is a bit more flexible than church. So it's a bit harder to do, but, you know, some people need, you know, that consistency just so they're disciplined enough to go soul winning. Um, what about, Simon, what are you laughing about? Can you be quiet, please? Yeah, well, you guys shouldn't be talking, all right? Okay, be quiet and listen. So, um, where was I? So, so Bible reading. Does God come first in your Bible reading? Like, if I was to ask everyone here, right? If I was to ask everyone, you know, how much Bible reading do you actually do? You know, are you reading your Bible every day? Would, would we be embarrassed if we actually took a, you know, hands up and said, hey, who, who's actually reading their Bible every day? I think so, because the question is, hey, you know, is God actually coming first? Are you setting some time aside to actually read your Bible? You know, this is the reason why we read through the Bible in a year and we have this daily Bible reading schedule so that you can just tag along with it and there's some discipline there. Otherwise, you just don't read your Bible for days and days and weeks on end. You have to actually make that time to read your Bible. It doesn't just happen 
automatically. And sometimes you get home, you know, especially if you've got a TV, you'll just sit there, waste time in front of the TV, waste time browsing YouTube, waste time. You know, I, I, I've been there as well. I know what it's like. You know, that stuff is really addictive, right? You get on Facebook, especially Facebook, you always watch like one video and you're like, oh, that's interesting. And then it just like scrolls on, it's like next video, next video. And you just keep going, right? You waste all that time. You know, why don't you just make it a point to say, hey, what, before I even do any of this leisure stuff, why don't I get stuff done for God? I've got to read my Bible. I've got to get some things planned. You know, I've got things to do at home as well. Other stuff like that. So do that even before you start browsing those things. You know, are you reading through the whole book? See, the reason why I think it's a good idea to follow a plan and follow a schedule is because if you don't, you just end up reading parts of the Bible that you like rather than just reading through the whole thing. And you'll be amazed at what you learn and you find um, just from reading it. And the last thing just to do with our spiritual life is prayer. Prayer, do you take time to pray? I mean, have you even booked, I mean, I've shared the Google Sheets link with all our prayer requests on it. Have you even saved that link? Have you even saved it so you can access it easily? You know, one thing I often do is, you know, when I get some time off at work, you know, if I'm, you know, just, a, you know, if I just go on a lunch break and I've just got some time, or even if I'm driving on my way to work, I might just pull it up and just have a look at it and just pray while I'm driving. I mean, that time is dead. You know, let's say, for example, you, you, you catch a train to work or you catch a bus to work. You know, why don't you pull open the prayer list and look at some of the prayer requests so that you'd know what people are requesting to pray. And then, you know, maybe you look at your prayer request and send Victor an update and update your prayer request, right, if they're, if they're no longer updated. So keeping God first. Are you keeping God first in your schedule? See, I, I don't wonder what I do on Sundays. You know, and even before, you say, oh, of course, Victor, because you're pastoring this church. But yeah, even before I was pastoring this church, I didn't wonder what I did on Wednesday nights and what I did on Sundays because I was keeping God first. I don't wake up on Sunday morning and think, am I going to keep God first today? You know, no, because I've already set that in my schedule. When you think about you know, your daily schedule, you've already blocked out time. Hey, this is when I'm going to winning this week. This is when I'm going, you know, to church this week. So I don't wake up on Sunday and then make that decision. I've already made that decision. Why? Because I'm keeping God first in my schedule. Let's talk about a different area. I've got three areas. So this is the second one. The second one is in work. Are we keeping God first? So I just wanted to share Colossians 3 with you. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. So remember, even in your work or in your business, you need to be keeping God first as well, because ultimately when we go to work and we make money, we are serving Jesus Christ. So when you think about how you operate your business or how you operate as an employee, are you doing it with diligence and integrity, right? Are you working honestly? Are you doing the right thing, right? Are you working hard for your boss and giving your boss value for money, what they're paying you to do, right? Because ultimately we're serving the Lord. And I, we even talked about it before. Do people know you're a Christian? Do you keep yourself accountable that way? That you let people know how you're a Christian? So that gives you some accountability in how you respond, how you talk to people. Right? If people don't know you're a Christian, maybe you know, you'll you know, uh, you know, swear at them on the phone or you'll, you know, you'll curse a customer or something like that. Whereas if, you, if, if they know you're a Christian, then you know there's hey, a certain level of, of, of a standard of behavior you should have. It's like if you, if you drive a car and your license plate is live for Christ. And then you're just like swearing and you know, giving people the bird. The chances are you won't if you know that, that you have a testimony to keep on, uh, on your car. So work ethics, do people know you're a Christian? You know, are you willing to lose your job for doing what's right? You know, when your boss asks you to do something dishonest, are you willing to say, no, I'm not going to do that and risk, you know, even losing your job or having a, a bad relationship because you're willing to do what's right? What about the type of work? You know, I don't think anyone here really does anything that's dodgy, but, you know, there are people that work in, you know, for example, nightclubs. I don't think that's a good place for a Christian to work, you know, the way people are dressed, the, the, what they're sort of promoting at the nightclub, uh, or in, in some, some pubs are pretty bad as well. Not all pubs, I think, are bad. You know, some pubs are more like a restaurant. Um, or maybe you're doing something illegal. You know, maybe if, you're, if your job is in, you know, in fraud, 
where you know, people are selling like fake watches or fake handbags and fake this and fake that on eBay. And obviously there are things that you know, are completely unclean and ungodly like prostitution. You know, somebody's obviously selling their body illegally for money and things like that. We need to keep God first in our work. And not only that, like how do you spend your money? So once you make money, how are you spending it? Like does God actually have a place in your budget? Or do you only give God what's left? You know, you spend all your money and all your things and all your tech and all your gadgets and your house and your boat and your cars and your holidays and you're like, oh, you know, I didn't give God anything. Or does God have preeminence in your finances, right? How do you spend your money? Do you think, hey, I make all this money. What am I ultimately making money for, right? If I'm living for God, that's what I'm making money for. I'm making money for God. Right? So it's not all about just piling it in. I'm not just saying give it all to this church, but maybe you have something in your life that you want to do for God. Right? You want to create something for God. You want to create something and do something. You have a project that you're working on. Does that have any space in your life? Right? Have you made any space for that and think, hey, this is some things where I'm going to make some money so that I can support this project or do this for God. What are you ultimately seeking to make money for? When you go out and make more money, have you thought about why do you do it what's the purpose and if it's not god at the top then you've got your priorities wrong right god has to be kept first even in your finances now the last one i want to talk about is just relationships keeping god first in your relationships now what do i mean by that especially for people that are single right when people are single and they're thinking about who to marry they think they they, they often think about people that make their life complete they're very, always thinking about it from a selfish point of view. People that they have fun with, they want, to have, they want somebody to serve them, they want somebody to complete their life. That's not what marriage is about. Marriage is not about serving you or serving each other. That, that comes because you're serving God first, right? So your marriage has to keep God first as well. So you need to look for somebody to marry who's going to serve the Lord together with you, right? How many times have I seen, you know, young people praying so hard that, you know, that they'll find somebody to marry, you know, they're, they're asking God to give them a spouse, and then when they get that spouse, they're so obsessed with that spouse that God now takes second seat. Isn't that funny that people will pray and pray and pray to find somebody to marry, and then when God gives them some, somebody to marry, then that's when they drop out of church. That's when they're, they're too busy spending time with their spouse that they weren't as dedicated before you know, when, when they were in youth group, for example. I saw that all the time. In youth group, people would be praying about who to marry, who to marry, and all these conversations would be about boy-girl relationships, and then you go to family camp and youth camp, you want to hear about sermons about dating and finding a spouse, and then they get married, and then they start working, and then they're not even in church anymore. You know? So what, what happened with keeping God first? So we need to keep God first in our relationships and we need to remember that our marriage is not just about fulfilling our desires, it's about serving God. What about with our children? Right, now that you're married, you know, you have children, do you keep God first when you think about raising your children? You know, how many times when I was in youth group, so many people, they, they wanted to, to, you know, young ladies as well, they wanted to get married, raise a family, live for god you know fulfill that calling that god had for them but then what do you hear oh my parents want me to go to uni my parents want me to work first my parents want me to chase a career right we need to break that culture we need to break that culture where we're encouraging young women to go and be a man right and go chase a career and and make something of themselves rather than you know trying to think about how to be a godly mother raising the next generation how to be a efficient and godly mother raising more children right that's what god wants us to do so especially us as parents when we think about the next generation we don't want to be like our parents were where they just glorified qualifications for women and them making something of themselves. No, we want our women, we want our daughters to follow the will of God, to marry, bear children, guide the house, right? Because that's what's more, that's what's keeping God first. Why? Because God wants godly children and you only get godly children if mom is at home teaching them. It's funny, Elizabeth was at the hospital and uh you know i, I can't I probably will butcher this story but she was just telling me it was funny that the lady that was across for her, from her um and how they were complaining about their husbands 
you know, husbands don't do anything. Husbands like a, you know, another child they have to look after. Amen. You know, it's probably like that in my house. But they don't help around at home, and they don't do all this stuff. And and you know, one, there was these two sisters, and, and one of them had one child, and she and the one that had the one child was saying, oh, she'd rather be single because no accountability, she has to ask anyone for money. But she even admitted that it's hard for a child, right? Because now the the parents are split up. Now they have to ferry the child in between the two parents. And then her sister had three children. And I think uh, the nurse or something said something like, oh, I don't see a blessing you got three children. She's like, no, no, I wish I only had one child. It's like, how? And I'm just like, this is such a the sad state that this world is in. But they, they don't even know how miserable they are. You know, because like, you know, in my life, my marriage is great. You know what I mean? Like when you actually follow... God's man. And those of you who have, have learned what God expects of you in a marriage and you're following that, you have a happy marriage, you have a great marriage. You know, things work well when we follow God's methods, but when we get away from God's methods, you know, it causes problems. People aren't happy in the world. And who suffers? It's the children that suffer. Right? The children suffer when we don't follow God's methods, right? Because then they're not raised with the right character. So we need to get away from this culture of taking women out of the home, sending them off to work, dropping your kids off at daycare, letting the government schools raise them into ungodly people that don't even believe God anymore and you know, just think that they can be a woman or be a man and everything goes. We need to get away from that, right? We need to get back to godly principles. You know, men have to make sure that they're keeping God first. Don't move somewhere. Like how many times do men, they take a job, they move somewhere and there's not even a church for their family to go to. You know, they don't think about these things. Why? Because they're not keeping God first. And like I talked about, you know, women being encouraged to chase a career rather than just getting married and raising children, right? Because that's what's more important. That's what God wants from us. Where else in our relationships? The last thing I just wanted to mention was um, just who you keep company with. Are you keeping God first in the company that you keep? And I just think about just a, as, as a general group, you know, friends, extended family, and church family, right? Just the, the two opposing worlds, right? Sometimes they, they, hopefully they can come together, but sometimes these are two opposing worlds where your friends and your extended family are a bad influence. So are you keeping God first in those relationships in the sense that when you select people that you hang with, are you hanging with people that are a good influence to you, that are making you seek God, that are encouraging you to keep the commandments of God, or are they pulling you away from God? You know, you're hanging with friends that pull you out of church, pull you out of soul winning, don't encourage you to read your Bible. And think about the sort of people, especially if you have children, the sort of people that you're hanging with, do you want your children's closest friends to be the friends of people that don't want anything to do with God as well. Like, you know, I don't want my children's closest friends to be their cousins, where, where my, brother, my sisters, you know, they don't, they don't even want anything to do with church. They don't, like, I don't want their closest friends to be their I want their closest friends to be people in a Bible-believing church, right? So think about who your friends are, who you're hanging with, and who your children are going to hang with, right? Because your closest friends ought to be in the same mentality, you know, if I'm keeping God first in my relationships, who are my closest friends going to be? My closest friends are going to be God's family, right? The ones that are encouraging me to do right. And that's who I want my children's closest friends to be. So that's why, you know, we need to be close as a church family, you know, encourage one another so that our children will also have friends that have the right character, the right environment, the right mentality. So we need to increase good company. You know, we serve one another. You know, think about who your children's closest friends are going to be. So that's all I really wanted to talk about. So just a reminder to keep God first. Keep God first in your schedule. You know, prioritize God in your time. Keep God first at work. Keep God first in the relationships that you have, whether it's your marriage, your children, the friends that you keep. And you need to make changes in your life. You know, make the changes in your life. Don't listen to a sermon like this and just live the same way when you leave. Make those changes. You know, get involved more in church. Make friends at church. You know, get the sin out of your life. And if you're thinking you can't do it, I just want to show you one last verse with you. The Bible says here in Philippians 4, I can do all things through Christ 
which strengtheneth me. Because people think, oh, I just, things are too hard to change. You know, it's too hard to get away from the family, too hard to get away from my friends. No, you know, you can make those changes. If you start making a stand for Jesus Christ, it gets easier. You know, I remember, because we all had, you know, I wasn't born in a Christian family. You know, I, I, I had worldly friends. I had friends from high school. And I know what it's like to go through that transitional period where, you know, you want to live, you don't want to just, you want to hang around with your friends, just smoking and drinking, talking about the things of the world, you know, and then you start asking them about Jesus Christ. You start talking about those things. They start to not want to really hang around you. So then you start making closer friends at church because they're the people that you want to talk about things with and you still want to hang out with and, and your life starts to transition and you don't desire to go back to that. You know, I don't want, like sometimes when I go back to Perth, I don't want to hang out with my old friends all the time because it's like, you know, they, I just, sometimes I just catch up to see how things are going and, you know, hopefully talk to them a bit, you know, to, to, just to let them know what's happening with church and things like that. But, you know, I remember when I used to just hang out with them and, and, and we just used to talk about rubbish, talk about movies, talk, talk about Futurama, Simpsons, <laughs> talk about those things. And I just feel like, I don't want to waste time doing that. I'd rather, I'd rather, you know, hang with people here that are on fire for God, you know, want to talk about what things we're going to do next for God. I want, to, I want that sort of influence in my life and in my family. Anyways, let's pray. All right, thank you, Lord, for the reminder. Help us always, Lord, to keep you first. I just pray, Lord, it's not easy. Um, we just pray that you would help us, give us your grace. Help us to make the changes, Lord, in our life. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. So help us, Lord, to always keep you first in our work, in our schedule, in our life. Uh, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.